Sayyid Ali, welcome to Let the Quran Speak. Thank you. Now, one of the core concepts in Shi'ism is this idea of the imamate. Can you explain what that is? There is a 12th century scholar by the name of Muhammad al-Shahrastani who writes a book called Kitab al-Milal wal nahad a book of creeds and sects. And he is analyzing the different Muslim sects that existed in the Islamic civilization up until his point. And he begins his book by saying that the biggest contention that existed in the Muslim Ummah was the issue of Khilafah and Imama, meaning who will lead the Holy Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi wa alihi after his demise. So for, for the Shia, this is you know, a very important issue at that point because it is the crux of Tashayyu. It is the crux of you know, the Shia faith, mm -hmm. which is that who is going to lead the, uh, the Prophet afterwards? Because whoever will come and lead the Holy Pro uh, after the Holy Prophet, is essentially going to be the official representative, the official interpreter of the prophetic sunnah and will be responsible for the guidance of the ummah. Mm -hmm. So for us, it's a very important matter. So for Sunnis, we just think about it as a political issue, like a leadership issue. Right. But I understand that for Shia Muslims, it's a theological issue. issue. Yes. So can you explain how it becomes theological? So look, first, of, first and foremost, this issue exists in the books of theology. Mm -hmm. you know, do you even need a leader or not? And yes, majority of the Muslims believe that yes, you do need a leader. The Ahlul Sunnah though ended up saying that this leader is somebody that the Ummah can come and you know, uh, choose either through a council or through direct appointment. Whatever is there you know, for the benefit of the Ummah, you can come and choose someone. For the Shia, no, we believe that this position is so integral and important for the you know, say, uh, protection of the Ummah that this cannot be left to, in the hands of the people. Hmm. That there has to be a divine appointment over here. Meaning the Prophet ﷺ has to come and explicitly tell the Ummah who is the, going to be the individual who will lead him. Hmm. And when we say Prophet over here, we mean by extension Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So Imamat becomes a divine a position for us and hence why it gets that theological you know, uh, flavor to it essentially. Mm -hmm. This is what the Shia position was. And we have certain ayat of the Quran and certain reports from the traditions of the Holy Prophet, which we cite as a precedent to say that it is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who is the one who appoints a leader. You know, for example, when uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala creates Adam alayhi salam, the angels are conversing with him and Allah says, Inni ja'alun fil ardi khalifa. It is I who does ja'al and places on the earth the khalifa. So we will cite some of these verses as a precedent to say that this entire designation is not something that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has left in the hands of the people. Mm -hmm. It is something that he will appoint. And obviously he does that through the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi. Now where on earth did this actually happen? The Ahlul Sunnah are probably wondering, you know, when did this even happen? There are many incidents in the lifetime of the Holy Prophet, which we cite, you know, and we say that no, there are many places where the Prophet very clearly and explicitly let the companions know that after him it will be Imam Ali who will lead. And the most important of these events is the, after the farewell pilgrimage that the Prophet makes, he stops at a nearby, at a pond called Ghadir. Mm -hmm. And in this, uh, you know, pond, near this pond, which is a valley of Ghadir, he essentially gathers all the Muslims that are there and he takes Imam Ali alayhi salam and he says, Man kuntu mawla fahada aliyun mawla. Whosoever mawla I am, whosoever ruler I am, which is, that's the Mawla is the word where their contention is mm -hmm. because the Ahlul Sunnah say that this is just a, a proclamation of friendship. Mm -hmm. And we say, no, this is a political you know, declaration being made here that whosoever leader I am, Ali is also his leader. So essentially we say that the Prophet explicitly appointed him. Unfortunately, after the demise, we believe that this right was not uh, given to the Imam and it was usurped. There is now a further, one further discussion here. Okay, let's say that the Muslim Ummah needs a leader. And we believe that this leader has to be divinely appointment. What are some of the qualities of this imam? Like who can just who can who should be the leader? Mm -hmm. We say there are two main qualities. One is knowledge, and what we mean here is that the person who will lead the ummah must have comprehensive knowledge of Islam mm -hmm. and the prophetic sunnah and the seerah of the Holy Prophet sallallahu alaihi wa For example, we know that the Prophet said many things in many different places in many different times, and these things have context. Maybe some, some statement of his abrogated another statement of his. Maybe something he said was in a political context, but something else was said in a very personal context. The personal one should not necessarily become a fatwa or, or you know, an obliga obligation for the Muslims. But who is going to be the one who's going to figure all these details out? A normal person is very difficult for them to figure these things out. It becomes very speculative and ijtihadi. 
But we believe that the Imam is the one who has this complete knowledge. Mm -hmm. And because this is an extraordinary ability, it is essentially a grace from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala graces them with this knowledge and this mm -hmm. ability. Mm -hmm. So that's number one, knowledge is the key. Second is, okay, well this knowledge now has to be applied. So once he is a leader, he has this comprehensive knowledge, he's going to be applying it for the Muslim Ummah and the application can vary from time and place and circumstances. This application also has to be perfect. It cannot be mistaken because mm -hmm. if the Imam makes a mistake in the application, well, it kind of defeats the purpose, mm -hmm. right? So not only is there a comprehensive knowledge, but there's also a guarantee and a protection from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala himself that he will not make any error and blunder in the application of, the, of, of Islam, essentially. Mm -hmm. So Sayyid Ali, how is the Imam different from the Prophet? So, I mean, obviously, he does not get any revelation. So okay. there is no more revelation after the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi. That's the crux of it, essentially. So mm -hmm. the Imam's role is to take the teachings of the Prophet, of the Qur'an. He is the perfect interpreter and the one who understands it comprehensively. And his role now is to now continue the prophetic mission. Mm -hmm. Of course, Islam uh, com was completed by, the, uh, you know, when the Prophet passed away, it was completed. But Islam itself is not gone anywhere. Islam is still here. Somebody has to take responsibility to make sure that it is being implemented and the Ummah stays on the straight path, essentially, mm -hmm. at the end of the day. This Imam is infallible, I understand, right? And, yeah. and has um, certain knowledge that other people don't have. So right. th this makes me think that the Imam is more like a Sunni would think of as a prophet. That's why I asked. No, so uh, that's what I was referring to that. Look, he has comprehensive knowledge of the prophetic Sunnah and yes, hence why I'm saying Allah graces them with this knowledge, mm -hmm. of course. And secondly, the infallibility is what I'm talking about when it comes to application. Mm -hmm. He has to be protected. If he's not protected, then it defeats the purpose of the entire Imam as far as the Shia position is concerned. Mm -hmm. So I understand there are 12 Imams, yes. right? And the last one is in hiding. Can you, can you explain how that yeah. works? So we believe that there's a series of 12 Imams, but because of the oppression and the persecution that was happening uh, you know, within, uh, against the Shia community and even against the Imams, some of our later Imams were in house arrest or they were imprisoned. We believe Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in his you know, infinite wisdom decided to protect the 12th Imam. So we believe he is born. The Ahl Sunnah believe he is not born yet, which is the Mahdi. Mm -hmm. It's essentially the Mahdi. Yes. Ahl Sunnah believe he's not born yet, he will be born and he will come and you know, implement justice in the world. We believe no, he is somebody who is born, but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has taken him in occultation and given him protection. And we are waiting for his reappearance, inshallah. So do you believe that he's alive? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Because I believe that he was born in, in the year 800 something, right? Yes, in the city of Samarra. Okay. Yeah. So what's going to happen when he comes back? Well, over there, the Shia and Sunni have a very similar view that, you know, the world will be filled with oppression and tyranny and the Mahdi will come and inshallah, fill the world with justice and peace. And we hope to see that day very soon, inshallah. Mm -hmm. Now, what happens with the fact that he is, you know, he's hidden right now? So where is the guidance coming from? So the political guidance is no longer there. And this is something that we understand, you know, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives you the grace. But sometimes the Ummah can do what we call kufran of ni'mah. Mm. They can sort of belittle the ni'mah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and He can deprive the Ummah from that. So we have this understanding of that. But we also believe that the, that the entire cosmos is sort of in place because of the existence of the Imam. So what we mean over here is that it's almost like the sun behind the clouds. So just like the sun continues to give its effects and, and benefit to the earth, even when it is hidden behind the clouds, the Imam's role is almost like that. So essentially, it, it, the entire cosmos, the entire earth is existing because of his uh, grace. Mm -hmm. This is one of the understandings that we have in our theology. Mm -hmm. So I guess Shia Muslims then don't feel lost because the Imam is in hiding right now. No, we definitely do feel lost. You do feel lost. We, we feel upset and we feel sad and we pray all the time that inshallah Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala brings back the Imam and that he reappears. Of course, I, I think all Muslims are waiting for the, for the Mahdi to see that day. No, we do, uh, we do feel you know, upset at that, but it's also an understanding that this is the circumstances that we are in, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. yeah. So who do you rely on for guidance then in the meantime? So today we rely on the jurists. Mm -hmm. So the jurists are responsible for going to, going to the hadith, going to the Quran, going to the teachings of, of the Prophet Sallallahu and deriving laws, deriving you know, the, the theological discussions and so on and so forth. Sayyid Ali, I've learned so much from you and there's still so much more we could learn on this issue and on many others. So thank you for joining us. I hope you'll be back and we can continue our conversations. Inshallah. Thank you. It was an honor to be here. Thank you. 
On behalf of Let the Quran Speak, I want to say thank you. You've helped us become the most widely watched Muslim TV show in Canada. I want to appeal to you to continue to support us. You can visit our website, QuranSpeaks.com. We also accept e-transfers to iGive at QuranSpeaks.com. And we're now on Patreon, so you can make a monthly contribution. May God bless you and your loved ones today and always.